We will be reading sections of the book of Esther today, but our primary scripture reading for the series we begin today, entitled For Such a Time as This, is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3. That is the key scripture from which we launch this new series, For Such a Time as This. 2 Timothy chapter what? 3 and verse verses 1 through 5, and then we'll skip to 12 through 17. So read along with me, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 first, and then 12 through 17. 2 Timothy is in the New Testament, near the end of the Bible. It's one of the small letters that Paul wrote to several people. This goes to Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, chapter 3. The apostle says, but know this, dangerous or perilous times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unloving, (laughs) unholy, irreconcilable or unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. Verse 12, in fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, because you know those who taught you. And you know that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. The Bible book of Esther tells an intriguing story that illustrates how the hand of God guides the future from the present, just as he has guided the past. It also shows that each one of us who are worshipers of the God of heaven have an important role to play in God's plan. I've chosen this Bible story to launch this series because I believe we too live in perilous times, as the Apostle Paul calls it. Just like the times of Esther. The times, the place has changed. But the times, they are the same. The story of Esther is an exciting story worthy of any movie. Wait a minute, they did make a movie about it, didn't they? Vashti, the queen of Persia, publicly defied the king's order, plunging the capital city into a never-before-seen crisis. The king spared Vashti's life, but he stripped her of her title. You know the story uh, very well. And this creates now a vacancy in the queen's chair. And that vacancy is to be filled by holding a contest. The vacancy is open to all women in the empire of Persia. The queen was looking, or the king was looking for a new queen. And he opened the position to anybody who would apply. The only thing they had to be unmarried, single. It was the best gossip to come out of the capital city of Susa that anyone could remember. So news of this palace intrigue spread throughout the empire like a wildfire, devouring everything in its path. In the wake of this firestorm, a beautiful young woman named, with the Jewish name of Hadassah, was escorted to the palace of the king with hundreds of other single women from all over the empire. And that empire extended from India to Ethiopia. If you look on the map, that's a big, big area. 127 provinces. The book of Esther tells us right there in the very first couple of verses. But the plot thickens. Esther is one of many, 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 many women who are taken to the palace of the king. How does she become queen? Well, I believe that the hand of God was moving even then, even though Esther did not know it, the hand of God was moving 
to orchestrate the future from the present just as he had the past. She is chosen as Queen Hadassah, this beautiful young woman who comes to be known in the empire of Persia as Esther, the shining star. We know her today mostly by that name, Esther, the shining star. But the plot thickens even more. A palace official named Haman, the ruler of the 127 princes that governed all the 127 provinces, this man Haman had an axe to grind, and he hatched a plot to exterminate all the Jews. You know the story well, so I'm not going into the details. If this is new to you, I encourage you to turn to the Old Testament book of Esther sometime this afternoon. It's just to the left of Psalms, which is in the middle of the Bible. If you're new to the Bible, it might be a little hard to find. But if you look at the middle of the Bible, you'll find Psalms. Go to the left of that, and you will find the book of Esther. Read the story again. Not watch the movie, by the way, because there are several, uh, what do you call that, artistic licenses <laughs> that are taken there. But read that story again, just as it's presented there. But, so I'm not going to cover a lot of details, but I'm, I just want to use this story as a springboard to where we are going in this series. Now, this man Haman had an axe to grind. He plots to exterminate the Jews, but Haman didn't know that Esther was a Jew. Perhaps because she was of mixed race. In fact, not even the king was aware that Esther was a Jew. So he signs off on Haman's plan. And the Jews are scheduled to be exterminated on a certain given day. Now Mordecai, Esther's adoptive father and also cousin, since her parents had died, he adopted her uncle's daughter, it says in the book of Esther, and adopted her as his own child. You'll find that in Esther chapter 2 and verse 5. Esther, or Mordecai, Esther's adoptive father and cousin, was a descendant of a Jewish nobleman. It tells us right there in the first few verses that his great-grandfather was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar many years before, at the same time that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken to Babylon captive. So uh, Kish, I believe his name is, his great-grandfather is a nobleman from Israel that was taken captive to Babylon. The Bible says that Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now, I tried to figure out what that meant, and I've read several commentaries, and I've studied the scriptures again, and I've come up with this, that Mordecai was probably the Jewish representative in the king's court, and therefore the one in charge of translating the king's orders into Hebrew so that those orders could go back to, to, the, to Israel. Remember, the, the empire was vast and there were people of all different uh, races and all different languages. So whenever an, an, an edict went out, somebody had to translate that. Now we believe that Mordecai was that person in the king's court that trans or represented Israel and therefore was in charge of translating the king's order, uh, orders to the Jews, which were sent out in many different languages. I think the story bears my conclusion out because Mordecai is the only one who finds out about this decree in the story. When Mordecai becomes aware of Haman's plot, he sends a message to Queen Esther asking her to go into the king and ask for the life, plead for the life of her people. What's Esther's response? Anybody remember? I, I can't do that. Uh, Esther refuses at first reminding Mordecai that she could be put to death for going into the king's throne without being invited. In fact, the story says that she had not even seen the king for 30 days. So now, to just show up would have been an egregious fault. And she refuses at first to go in without being invited. Do you remember what Mordecai's answer to that was? What was it, Yannette? From somewhere else. That's right. Mordecai says, ha -ha, listen up. <laughs> Don't think because you live in the king's palace, you're going to escape. That you find it in Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and, th and 14. Ex Esther 4, 13 and 14. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace many more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, he adds, yet, who knows 
whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Listen, every generation is here for such a time as this. You are here for such a time as this. And what a momentous time it is in earth's history. Prophets would have given their right arm to live in these days. They have, would have plucked out their eyes to be able to see, pun intended, these days. But we are here for such a time as this. So Mordecai's words resonate even with me today, living so many thousands of years later. And do you remember what Esther's response to Mordecai was when she heard that compelling answer? Who knows, but you have come to the throne for such a time as this? In verse 16 of Esther chapter 4, uh, Esther responds to Mordecai. She says, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Susa and fast for me. Okay, Fasting. Do you understand what that is? Okay, no food, right? Why? You're denying yourself, okay? For what purpose? To be connected with Christ. So what's denying yourself meaning? What, what's that is? What, what's that? You know, what about that? Why should, can God hear you even if you have food in your stomach? Yes, he can. But I believe, and I agree with, with, with the sister that said, it, it, is, it is to deny yourself of food in order to, to, to pray to God. I think what that says is, God, I have nothing else better to do, not even food, but to talk to you right now. I have no greater need, not even food, but to talk to you right now. I have a great need that supersedes all other needs. You know, food is one of those things right up there in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right? You got to breathe. You got to drink water. And you got to eat. Right? If you don't breathe, you're dead. Now, you could breathe and not drink water or food for a while, and you'll survive a while. You could breathe and drink water for a while, and you'll survive for several days. There are people who have not eaten for 40 days, for instance. They made it. But if you don't do those three things... For more than 40 days, they'll be carting you out to the hospital or worse, you know, to the funeral home. So denying yourself of food, as Esther did, is saying, God, I am desperate here. My uh, hierarchy of needs has just flipped itself on its head. I have nothing more important but to lay before you and plead for my cause, plead for the cause of your people. And so I am denying myself even of the basic need of eating in order to seek your face. Esther said, go gather all the Jews who are in the city that they may fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. See, some people, and right now we're in the period of Ramadan, a lot of people are fasting during the day, but they gorge themselves at night. Esther said, none of that, night or day, no food. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. God certainly did place Esther in a position to save his people from extermination at that time, just like Mordecai said. However, I have come to the conclusion, resting on the word of God, that there was Another reason, even bigger than the saving of the people. See, God, God would not allow his people to be exterminated. He had a lineage to bring uh, the Messiah from. But a lot of people could have died. But I think the reason why Esther came to the throne for such a time as this was even greater than avoiding the slaughter of a few thousand Jews. What is that reason, you may ask me? Well, hold on a little longer. We're not even going to answer that today. It's going to be in two weeks that it's going to really flower, but I need to lay some groundwork for you today, all right? So, so you've got to hear this one today so you can understand the, the next one in two weeks, okay? So God certainly did place Esther there. He's placed us too, and who knows, but for such a time as this, you and I have come into the world But you've got to see, just like Esther, this may be more than just about you. This may be more about just our time. This, our life, Esther's life, has effects that go far beyond the present and the now. Because God 
the hand of God is guiding the future from the present. Just as he has guided in the past. So, here's what we know about Esther from Scripture. In chapter 1, we're told that King Ahasuerus, he's called there, and Ahasuerus is, I, I think that's the Hebrew name for this man. Uh, he's also known in history as Xerxes the first, because there were several other uh, Xerxes. But Xerxes the first, he's also known as Xerxes the Great. Xerxes is the king. I have a list of all the kings of Persia here. But Xerxes the first is the king that is known for the Battle of Thermopylae. Remember the 300 men, the 300 Greek men, soldiers that withstood the Persian army? The Battle of Thermopylae. That's who that king was. Xerxes the first. Xerxes the Great. He is son of Darius the first. All right? Darius the Great. He's also called. They all thought they were great. <laughs> So King Ahasuerus, Xerxes I, the Great, begins to rule Persia in the fall of the year 485 before Christ. Right? That's chapter 1 of Esther. What's the year? 485. Okay, so I don't need to write it down, right? I have some other names to write down here because this is going to get a little complicated. You're going to need uh, playing cards before this is all over. It's a lot of names here. All right, here's what I've discovered. So King Ahasuerus, Xerxes I, begins to rule in the fall of the year 485. Now, the Bible tells us that in the third year of his reign, he throws a feast that lasts for six months. 180 days. It's right there in Esther chapter 1. 180 days, six months. Beginning in the year 483 and ending in 482 before Christ. Now, pastor, that doesn't make sense. You're counting backwards. Well, yeah, that's the way we count the years before Christ. We are counting down to the year zero. So he started to rule 485. He throws this party in 483 for six months. And it ends in 482 before Christ. That's Esther chapter 1 and verse 4. Here's what else we know about Esther in in this book. Esther is made queen in the tenth month, I quote, in the seventh year of Xerxes' reign. That's what it says in chapter 1. This means that She had to become queen in the year 478 before Christ. Esther chapter 2 and verse 16. Esther 2.16 gives the date of when she becomes queen. This is the year 478 before Christ. These dates will be important, and I'll repeat them in two weeks when we talk about this. I want to show you the great hand of God moving in ways that not even Esther could imagine. And that, frankly, I hadn't. Uh, uh, come upon until I preached a sermon here not too recently on, I think it was Hezekiah, not Hezekiah, um, Nehemiah, uh, re- rebuilding the, the temple. And it started to click, and I started to do some research and came up with an astounding discovery about Esther and why she comes to the throne for such a time as this. And it goes way beyond, like I said, avoiding the extermination of a few thousand Jews. All right, so she's made queen in the year 478, 478 before Christ. Now, here's what we know about Esther from secular history. Now, here's where you're going to have to follow me carefully, maybe even take some notes. All right, my markers are here. Cyrus, Cyrus the Great is where we're going to start. Cyrus Cyrus the first or Cyrus the great, TG. That's what the great uh, TG stands for. Cyrus the great conquered Babylon in the year 539. The date is irrelevant here for our study today. It, It was the 11th year of his reign, the Bible tells us, and history confirms that. He was followed by a king called Cambyses. All right. Uh, Spelling is C A M B Y S E S. Cambyses the second, and then followed by a king called Bardia. Uh, it's uh, B Y A, okay, Bardia, and his, he also has a name of Smyrdis. Yes, he has two names, Smyrdis. All right. Now Smyrdis is important here. We'll come back to him in just a little bit. But after Smyrdis comes Darius. He's mentioned in the Bible, right? Darius. 
Darius the first, or also known as Darius TG, the great. Xerxes the first, the man in the story of Esther, is the king that follows that king. Uh, Xerxes first follows Darius. And then after Xerxes the first, we have a man that you know well too, Artaxerxes. The first. All right? Does the name sound familiar? Artaxerxes. Sounds like Xerxes, right? Just with art in front of it. That's because he was the son of Xerxes. All right? The story of Esther talks about Xerxes the first. His son succeeds him. Artaxerxes the first. Artaxerxes is the one that started me on this quest because in the book of Nehemiah, he is the king that gives instructions for Nehemiah to go back to Israel and teach the word of God and rebuild the temple and reinstitute the, the worship of the true God. Okay, you following me now? All right, there's a connection to all of this. And the reason I'm putting this out here is so you can have a mental picture of who succeeds who. So Artaxerxes I is the king that later on decrees uh, to rebuild Jerusalem and, and all, all of that. He's also known in history as Longimanus, long hand. And there's a reason for that. There's a story that we will talk about sometime. Now, the book of Esther says that Vashti was the queen. Vashti was the queen, and she was the wife of King Xerxes the Great when he first became king of Persia. Vashti, Esther chapter 1. You remember her? Yes. All right. But in contrast to what the Bible says, history, modern historians, accept a queen called Amestris as Xerxes' wife. I'm going to write her name down here. A-M-E-S-T-R-I-S. Amestris. We're going to camp a little bit on that name, Amestris. Can everybody see if I move around enough? All right, Amestris. That's what uh, uh, secular history records. That's who secular history records as Xerxes' wife, the only wife for the first several years of his reign, based on three references in the works of the ancient Greek historian Herodotus. I went back and looked for those three references. I found them, and I read them. All right, I've done the research for you. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Herodotus makes three references to this woman, Amestris. By the way, the Greeks didn't like Amestris. Remember, the Greeks came after the Persians. She had a bad reputation. She was known as, quote, a hard woman to the Greeks. In these three references, upon which modern historians base their assumption that Amestris was the queen of Xerxes, one of those references is to an Amestris that was actually a man. The other two talk about a woman... But nothing in the stories could relate to, the, to a Persian queen at the time of Xerxes. Anyway, they, they, the modern historians assume that Amestris is the queen. And she's going to be important here for just one reason. That will become evident in just a moment. Amestris, according to the encyclopedia's entry by Jonah Lendering, is a word from the Greek, Amestris. And um, it's, uh, he sa- it says the translation of that word is tra- strong woman. And she was the wife of Xerxes I of Persia. And uh, she was known to have been poorly regarded by ancient Greek historians. Now, according to Herodotus, which I read, Amestris was the daughter of a nobleman named Otanis. Here's another weird name, Otanis. So she is the daughter of? Otanis. All right. Now, Herodotus writes a, a very interesting tale, and history seems to support this, that an imposter by the name of Gautama, had secretly killed King Smyrdis. Where is he? Right up here. Great-grandfather of Xerxes I. All right? This man named Gautama had secretly killed the king and began, began impersonating the king. 
Otanes had a daughter named Fadima who was married to Smyrdas, the king. So Otanes is the father-in-law of the king, Bardia. Now, Fadimia, his daughter, alerted Otanes, her father, that the man on the throne was not the real Smyrdas. The evidence that she gave was that the real king's ears were intact, while the man that was sitting on the throne, the imposter's ears, were missing, a clear sign that he had previously committed some crime against the king. Now, it, the, the story gets really interesting and convoluted, but what you need to know is this. Otanis orchestrates a plot to kill the imposter with the help of six other noblemen. The noblemen who eliminated the imposter agreed on a contest to select a new king from among them, Otanis including. But Otanis refused to be part of the contest. He didn't want to rule, he said, he didn't want to rule or be ruled. So his, his uh, reward for killing this imposter would be that he would serve no king. But he didn't want to be king himself. Now, I question, and, be, uh, and there's some other reasons why that I'm not mentioning here, that Otanis may have been a Jewish nobleman, just like Daniel. Remember Mordecai later in, in the history? He's a Jew also who, who discovers a plot to kill Artaxerxes I. There's a lot of plots going on here. This, this wasn't just clean. This wasn't like here. You have an election and whoever wins, well, sits there for four years and you have another chance to elect a new, new, new king or president, right? Th- there was a lot of intrigue here. And so uh, I am thinking that Otanis was probably a Jewish nobleman, just like Daniel, and he foils the plot to King Artaxerxes. Now, one of the six noblemen, Darius the Great, is the one who assumes the throne. He wins the contest, and he becomes king. You notice he is not son of any of these. Actually, he was actually a father-in-law of Cyrus, a son-in-law of Cyrus the, the Great. But he wins the contest, and he becomes the king. Now, remember, Otanis is the father of a mistress, whom history says is the wife of Ahasuerus, all right? Now, I'm trying to make the connection that Amestris and Esther are the same person. All right? That's what I'm trying to show you. Now, <laughs> after the death of... Oh, by the way, uh, according to Herodotus, Darius honored Otanis by marrying Otanis's daughter, Fadimia, the one that was married to the, the, the Bardia that was killed and the imposter took his place. Now, Darius honors Otanis by giving him as a wife... The, his daughter, Otanis, gives his daughter that was once married to the king. So now she is the queen again, right? And Otanis himself married one of Darius' sisters who gives birth to a mistress. So Otanis and one of Darius' sisters gives birth to a mistress. If Otanis is a Jewish nobleman, as I am conjecturing, he is producing a mistress who I am conjecturing, and not just me, but other historians too, Conjecture that Amestris is Esther. So Esther is of mixed race. Uh, that's important for you to follow. Remember, nobody knew she was Jewish. How could she hide that? All right, she must have been of mixed race. After the death of Darius in the year 486, Amestris married the crown prince. Guess who that was? Xerxes I. That's according to secular history. Now, uh, Bible tells us Vashti was the first queen, and Esther, who I'm saying is a mistress, then marries uh, the king. History doesn't record a Vashti. The only place we find Vashti is in the Bible. All right, here we go. The encyclopedia entry cites uh, Herodotus' histories 7.114, and I've read all of those. And the article also states, and I quote, Since most accounts of the time are from Greek sources, and due to the involvement of Greece as an opponent of Persia, and I underscore this, it is possible that not all accounts are accurate. Given the similarity of names and the parallel identification of Ahasuerus with her husband Xerxes, the first, it is possible, says the encyclopedia, that a mistress is the biblical Esther. Historian Dr. Wilson, who identified Ahasuerus with Xerxes I and Esther with Amestris, suggests that both Amestris and Esther derived from the Akkadian words Ami Ishtar. I'll write it down, but it'll take too long. It's a long name. Ami Ishtar. You hear the sounding? Ami Ishtar, or Umi Ishtar was another way to say it. 
Esther. All right. German historian Hoshander alternately suggests that Ishtar Uda Asha, Ishtar is her light, that's what it means, is the origin and possibly uh, the Udasha, Udasha was connected with the similarly sounding Hebrew name of Hadasha. The Bible and the Talmud both expound that Esther and Hadassah are the same person. So I'm concluding, as, other, as some historians have, that a mistress is Esther, is Hadassah. Other scholars conclude this, I quote, Given this, their ambiguity, the two texts from Herodotus offer less reliable evidence for, for events and customs in Persia than scholarly citations generally assume. The evidence, however, does leave open the possibility that Esther and Amestris may have been the same person. All right, let's leave that possibility open and assume that they are the same person. Now I'm going to tell you the rest of the story, and in two weeks we'll put it all together. In the book of Nehemiah, we find that Nehemiah is the, what's his job? No, 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 he, what's his job in Persia? He's the cupbearer, thank you very much. What is the cupbearer's job, anybody? He's a food taster. Why would he need to taste the food? Because, I told you, these people didn't just elect people. They just finagled and, you know, killed and poisoned and, you know, tried to take the position by force. They didn't trust anybody, so they had somebody of trust. This is important. Somebody they trusted to be to taste everything they ate to see if it was poison. Who is the taster of Xerxes? Nehemiah. Uh, the taster of Artaxerxes. That's right, Artaxerxes. Nehemiah is the taster of Artaxerxes. By the way, what nationality was Nehemiah? He's a Jew. Keep that in mind. I'm going to ask you a few questions in a little bit with this little fact that he was a Jew. is going to mess with your minds. All right, here we go. So in the book of Nehemiah, he is the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes I, the son of Xerxes. And it says in Nehemiah 2.1 that it was the 20th year of his reign. This fact raises some very interesting questions. Follow along quickly as we wrap this up for today. Why would King Artaxerxes place a person from a conquered nation as his cupbearer? You answer that. He's, a 25% Jew. <laughs> he's jumping ahead of me. Pedro said because he's 25% Jew. Pedro, I'm going to blow your mind. I think it's more than that. Okay. All right. So why would he put a, a Jewish person as the trusted person in his kingdom to taste his food. The other question that baffled me just a few weeks ago after I had preached on Nehemiah is that the responsibility of a cupbearer was to protect the king from being poisoned. Was this a position in which he would place an enemy? Yes or no? No. Ah. Then why was the king so interested in the feelings of a servant? You remember that? What he says to him? The king asked me, Nehemiah says, Nehemiah 2.2, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? See, it wasn't about that he was sick from the food he had tasted. Because he says, you're not ill. He knows he's not ill. But he knows his face looks sad. Why is he so interested in the emotions of a servant? This can be nothing but sadness of heart, the king says to Nehemiah. Which king? Artaxerxes I, a Persian king. All right. So that baffled me. Why is he so interested? And why would he put a Jew in this position? The third question that baffled me is why was he so generous to Ezra and to Nehemiah? Why is he so generous? Darius? Oh yeah, he knew, he knew who the Jews were. For sure. For sure. I'm going to look. I'm going to open the door a little bit for you. As you look at the dates, Esther and probably Mordecai are still alive at this time. Influence? influence? Okay. Well, good. We'll we'll stop there for now. They had influence over him. But this is going to blow your mind in a couple of weeks. Just wait. Let's hold on. Uh, he, by the way, you're welcome to jump ahead of me and go investigate and come up to, with the same conclusions. All right. So now, now, why was the king so interested in helping? Uh, sending these men to Jerusalem to restore the worship of Yahweh? Yeah, if he's a pagan, right? 
and, and to teach the Torah. I'm reading from Nehemiah now. To teach the Torah to those who did not know it. That baffled me. I'm going to give you a hint. It has to do something with Esther, as you obviously know already. But it has something to do, a lot to do, with the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel. Some of you, the lights bulbs just went on. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to come back in a couple of weeks, okay? But, but here's the application for today. God honored Esther's prayers. He honored her faith and her fasting. He honored her actions. Some of you are fasting here today. It's a day of prayer at Greater Randolph. We're praying for whom? For our children and our youth. Remember, some of these people we read about in the Bible in those days were taken captives as young teenagers. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. All these were young men. Kish, the great-grandfather of Mordecai. They were taken as young men. Esther, a young woman. Our young people are so key in God's plan as he orchestrates the future from the present, just as he has the past. And we need to pray like Esther. We need to fast like Esther for his people. We are under attack. God honored her prayers. And he brought deliverance to the Jews in time of peril. We too are living in what kind of times according to Second Timothy chapter 3? Perilous times. Perilous times. The Bible tells us in the last days, dangerous or perilous times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does it ever end? (laughs) Holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid these people. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted, must suffer persecution. So don't think this life is a bed of roses, church. We are followers of whom? Of Christ. Remember what they did to him? They crucified him. And he said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Ouch. And follow me. In times like these, just like in Esther's times, in times like these, We need to pray, church. You have an opportunity right now for corporate worship. Right after this service today is corporate time for prayer. Uh, By the way, if you didn't make plans to, to, to fast or whatever, there's food and you can eat. We made provision for that. But some of us are going to be in here praying, praying for our children and for our youth. When we live in times like these, like in Esther's days, we need to pray too. We need to fast when we're under attack. We need to pray when we don't know what to do. We need to pray when the odds are against us. We need to pray when the world is against us. Hebrews 10, verse 19 through 25 says that, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which He consecrated for us, through the veil that is His flesh, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's prayer, guys. We need to go to the throne room of God boldly like Esther. And if I perish, I perish. Boldly because Jesus Christ has made a way to the throne room of God. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. We need to pray And we also need to hold on to each other. Hebrews 10 verses 23 to 25 this time. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10 23 verse 24 says. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We need to hold on to each other. Verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We are living in terrible, perilous times. In times like these, we need to pray. In times like these, we need to hold on to one another. In times like these, we need to hold on to the faith that we have received. Second Timothy three thirteen and 14. Evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue... In what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing those who taught you. You gotta know where you got the information from. Once you trust that source, once you trust the Word of God, hold on 
to the faith you once received. We need to pray. We need to hold on to each other. We need to hold on to the faith we once received. And we need to stand firm on the word of God. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 19, you know this. We also have the more sure prophetic word which you do well to heed as a light that shines or a lamp that shines in a dark place until the day comes. You need a light while it's dark. But then the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. 2 Peter 1, 19. Friends, God did not leave us alone in this world, did he? I will never leave you or forsake you, he said. He has given us His Holy Spirit to guide us to truth. He has left the writings of the prophets to give us hope and to strengthen our faith. In times like these, church, we need to cling to the old rugged cross that we sang about earlier today. We need to cling to that cross in the hope that we'd exchange it someday for a crown. It's dark right now. The times, they are a perilous. But hold on. Hope is on the way. Help is on the way. Christ will soon come. And remember, He is the God whose hand guides the future from the present just as He has the past. We're going to go into a series that will delve into the prophecies that brought this faith, the Adventist faith, together. The prophecies that we know are there, but we just keep them on the shelf. And if somebody would ask you about the hope that is within you, You have to dust off your Bibles and try to figure it out. We need to remember again because the sure prophetic word is important in this night of darkness. We need to go back there because it's the light that is shining until the day comes when the star of brightness of Jesus Christ shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ will rise. Until that day, hold on to what God has given us. God has said, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your hearts. Friends, in times like these, God has promised that if we draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. Esther proves it. She draws near to God. She fasts and she prays for her people. And God brought a great deliverance. May that happen again to us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, your word is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. On this word we stand, on the prophets and on Jesus Christ. May him and his name be glorified in our lives, on our lips, and in everything we do. Amen.